The British seaside, it's as much a part of our national identity as Sunday roasts or real ale. Ever since the Victorians first promenaded on a pleasure pier, we've had a love affair with the seaside. At the first hint of a summer's day, we flock to the coast and get a bit silly. Help, my head's stuck. But there's a secret seaside that few casual tourists get to see. The rugged coastlines, the vast expanse of space, and the whole place to yourself. The seaside out of season is a different world, populated by hardy souls and real devotees. Oh, hey! There's so much going on. <laughs> you just need to know where to look. What a tremendous sight. It makes you proud to be British, it really does. For more than 30 years, I've been the lead singer of Madness. I've toured the world, played countless gigs, Enjoyed bust ups, changing lineups, and months in the studio. So, when I need a bit of peace, some time to myself, I head to the coast. I myself was born by the seaside in Hastings, so it's kind of in the blood of my family. I still get constantly called back to the sea. In fact, if I'm not here for a week or two, I start to get a bit kind of fidgety. Personally, because I live in a very urban environment, London, being able to even see the horizon is like a really marvelously relaxing thing. And to be able to see it with nobody else around, I find very tranquil. And what I love most of all about the seaside, at any time of year, is my beach hut. Like every red-blooded British person, you know, my greatest desire was to have a shed, and I never have. And so the beach hut for me is it, that is my shed. Let there be light. There we are, it's nice, isn't it, eh? Literally, no more than a man could possibly need or want. Now, there can't be anything finer than being in the beach on your own, football on the radio, barbecue all ready to go, fish in the bag, they really can't. Just being in a small wooden dwelling that is relatively precarious against the elements, it's just, I don't know, a magical thing. And it's not just me. These little sheds have become insanely fashionable. They sell for as much as £90,000 in some parts of the country. The beach hut seems to be undergoing a bit of a renaissance. Apparently Keith Richards has got one now, which I'd like to see, wouldn't you? Would you like to see Keith and Mick in a beach hut? Hey, where's the tea page, Mick? Can't find the sugars, OK? But in one particular seaside town, beach huts have become more than just fashionable. This is Mabel Thorpe in Lincolnshire. The seafront is lined with brightly coloured sheds. It's like beach hut suburbia. Catherine Ferry is an architectural historian who shares my love of the simple yet sturdy structure. Catherine. Hi, nice love. to meet you. And you. Now tell me, Catherine, how did you develop such a passion for these humble little wooden dwellings? Beach huts actually developed out of bathing machines that looked like beach huts, but they were on wheels. And they'd been going since the 18th century to wheel people from the top of the shore right into the sea. And then by the sort of 1890s, they're beginning to take their wheels off and you get the beach hut. Because of course, no Victorian juvenile should ever catch sight of a woman's ankle. Oh, oh, hell would break loose. The reason that bathing machines endured was because you had to keep men and women apart because men were going in without any clothes on. And the women were watching and they put the chairs on the beach and the women would move them forward so they could get a better view. <laughs> and the people who owned the, owned the chairs had to keep moving them back again and they'd go back and forwards <laughs> across the beach. So the beach hut has been preserving our modesty since Victorian times. But at Mablethorpe, there's been a beach hut revolution. In 2006, the town hosted a design competition to reimagine the beach hut for the 21st century. Catherine was one of the competition judges. This is a giant gin and tonic. It's called Come Up and See Me. Fabulous. Does Mae West pop out on the hour? <laughs> she should, she should. It's great, but I'm not feeling like I'm sitting in a beach hut, to be perfectly honest. It feels like we're sitting in an art installation. This is actually a camera obscura in this one. 
Yeah. Does it work? The giant lens in the roof. There's yes. a beach. Hey. Bench. People. This is Jabba. Jabba the Hutt. Well, it feels a bit like a set from Star Wars, actually. It does. It? The architects designed it to look like a 21st century version of a cave. Some sort of crazy psychedelic Bedouin That's it. dwelling. I'm a traditionalist, really, when it comes to the seaside. And I appreciate the imagination that's gone into these. But for me, they will remain works of art. I, I still remain a bit philistine in what I require from a beach hut, and that's four square walls, two little windows with curtains, and a kettle going in the background. The traditional beach hut isn't the only seaside feature we inherited from our Victorian ancestors. They also gave us piers. This one is on the Suffolk coast. Well, here we are in Southwold. The sun is shining, sound of the waves, and what could be finer than that beautiful sight of Victorian seaside architecture, the pier. Very traditional looking. Southwold Pier is owned by Stephen Bournes, and he's set about turning it into an attraction you can enjoy at any time of year. I mean, I've always believed in a 12-month season, and the, the winter's a great time, because you can bring your dog on the beach. You know, there aren't masses of crowds. In August, we're really busy, which is good fun, but if you want that sort of the peace of where you are, it's, it's better in the winter. And further up the pier you go, it gets windy, and so... It's a fairly brisk breeze, I've got to say. Yeah, now. But hey, it is. It here is. we are, it's gone. Good place to sit and read your book in January and forget the world's troubles. Did you always have a love of the sea? Well, funny enough, I was born in Birmingham. <laughs> so I didn't. <laughs> so you've, you've basically got a love of ring roads. <laughs> what is our abiding fascination with, with, with the pier? It's in the roots, isn't it? It's part, it's part of when we were building empires and all that stuff. They originally put up as a landing station for boats like this was put up in 1900 to land bell steamers from the Thames. So far, so traditional. But this pier also has some rather unusual features. Artist and engineer Tim Hunkin was recruited to reimagine elements of the pleasure pier in his own unique way. The result is brilliantly offbeat. The highlight is undoubtedly his Under the Pier show a purpose-built arcade of homemade slot machines and bizarre mechanical contraptions. Tongue-in-cheek humour, like all peers started off, this is the modern approach. It's been amusing and confusing visitors to the pier since 2001. You are a fly. <laughs> Eat whatever takes your fancy. Oh, no! We're heading for a dog turd. <laughs> Hands up! Oh, oh, it's the biggest thrill I've had all week. As much fun as you can have with your clothes on. Maybe it'd be more fun with your clothes off. <laughs> Push and hold. Oh, it's dribbling on me. Ah. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> Got me, god damn it. Ah, I'm relaxed. Hand covered in warm spit and only four fingers. Marvellous. Really had a great day here today, yeah, a really fabulous pier. As, as traditionalist as I am, I was really thrilled to see the newer elements. The ideas in the arcade are, are great. But I think they really are part of a kind of Victorian tradition of shock and amusement and, um, and surreality. Beach huts and piers, two defining features of the British seaside, two basic forms of weather cover. But for me, winter at the seaside is about more than sheltering from the fickle British weather, it's about embracing it. And in Brighton, a surprising number of hardy souls share my enthusiasm. But where I like to walk along desolate stretches of empty beach wrapped up warmly, they have an altogether different idea of fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's made this country what it is. There's nothing that a couple of pints of lager won't make a British man do. Come on, that's the spirit. What a tremendous sight. It makes you proud to be British, it really does. 
It's not just rugby lads on a stag weekend who enjoy a morning swim in early March. Brighton is home to the country's oldest swimming club. Hello there. How are you? Yeah. Hello, Keith. Nice to meet you. Keith Malton, a 71-year-old grandfather, leads the charge. You can come down here in you know, low spirits. We all have low spirits sometimes. And you get in the sea, and you can feel it all washing away. It's like being baptised, I always think. In the winter time, you can't stay in very long, five, ten minutes at the temperature it is now, which is just under five degrees. Is it a better time for you out of season, in well, fact? We regard this as our beach, and in the winter it's ours, because there's nobody else using it. In the summertime, it gets crowded, and we feel a bit usurped. Well, the armchair swimmers, the yeah, fair weather swimmers. Yeah, but we do have to make way for what I call civilians in the summertime, you know. Now, listen, we do have a wetsuit. <laughs> and we would really, really love it if you just come and at least put your feet in the water and see how you feel. Watching a bit of sea swimming is one thing, but actually going in, hmm. I'm not at all sure about this. I'm Suggs from Madness, and I want to show you why the seaside out of season is one of Britain's best kept secrets. Now I'm in Brighton, preparing to face the icy English Channel with a bunch of all weather sea swimmers. They've offered me a wetsuit, some chance. With the sea at less than five degrees, I think I'll take the more traditionally British approach. <laughs> Lovely, yeah, we'll at least get a flavour of it, eh? <laughs> oh, God. oh, yeah, that's refreshing. That is refreshing, watch goodness yeah. gracious me. Watch, watch when the big ones come. Oh, Jesus, that is fresh. Well, good luck, boys and girls. <laughs> the water is bloody freezing. Don't give me all that, it's quite a mild day today. That is absolutely freezing. It's like a sort of strange human seal colony, isn't it? This little kid here, he's only been in the summer before. This is the first time he's been out of season. Look, <laughs> go on, my son. I'm brave from the beach, aren't I, eh? Full of bravery here. How was that, Keith? Well, that was brilliant. Yeah. How, how, how was it for you? Nice, you know, refreshing. My toes feel as refreshed as you yeah. probably do all over. I've noticed yeah. it's brought a bit of colour yeah. to your chest there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you're ready for a cup of tea, yes. Yeah. Well, you can have an old wine. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. I don't think I'm quite ready to join the ranks of the sea swimmers, but I do like their attitude to mulled wine and cake. A hot toddy. Yeah. When you put the amount of effort I put into paddling this morning, who doesn't deserve a hot, slightly alcoholic drink? I wonder if everyone's got a rosy glow when they've finished here. I may not be ready to immerse myself in the English Channel, but there are other ways to enjoy yourself on a windy beach in winter. Well, here we are now in the wilds of Western Supermare. But we're not here today, believe me, to see beach volleyball or frisbee. We're here to see something a lot more rigorous and indeed dangerous. Nice to meet you, Suggs. And you. So Come to join us on a windy beach in the winter. <laughs> this is the real deal. This is the seaside out of season, all right? This certainly is. It's, uh, it's wet and it's windy and there's nobody else out here, so it's perfect for us. Dominic Early is former British para-karting champion. He's agreed to show me the ropes and I've agreed to let him despite knowing next to nothing about the sport. We've got a special area set aside, so we can do it all year round, but uh, the best winds are in the winter, so we go the fastest then, 50 miles an hour on a decent windy day. The one thing I was warned to look out for was gusts. This feels pretty yes. gusty to Yeah, me. there's a few gusts today. Uh, the other problem we've got is the beach being so wet. We'd prefer it if it was dry sand, makes it all the more pleasant, but we're going to get a bit mucky today. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we wanted pleasant, we'd go to the Mediterranean. <laughs> Right, okay. It's gone without the buggy. <laughs> For these guys, the seaside out of season is like an enormous playground. A giant sand pit with life-size toys. He's going a bit, eh? There's two types of steering when you're in the buggy. One is... Going, Hanging on. One is doing the your turns. Everyone's letting go. <laughs> 
Before Dominic lets me loose on a buggy, I have to prove I can master the basics. This one's very easy to use and it's giving plenty of power to pull you along on the buggy. <laughs> plenty of power, that's Yeah, it. but if you make a mistake with it, it's going to, it's going to pull you away. <laughs> As indicated. And just a small pull to the left, we'll steer the kite to the left and now correct it back to the right. Just, just let, it, let it come down. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's really blowing, really, really blowing. But it's this thing now I completely understand, this gust business. It's because, you know, you're just going along quite nice. Yeah, you think I've got that, and suddenly, whoa! And you're gone. A little bit lower. Whoa! Do a bit, whoa! So, quickly back to the left. After a bit of practice, Dominic feels I'm ready for the buggy. Yep. Right, it's coming too rearward on you. And we're straight away pointing towards the... Now you can start to straighten up. But he takes my kite away. You should be able to keep it steady here, and it will pull you along. Well, I'm fine with a human kite. Easy. Now I'm going to hand you the kite. OK. At last, a kite, a buggy, and an open expanse of empty beach. And left with the kite. Left with the buggy. That's it. Straight ahead there. Left with the buggy. Beautiful. Kite up, right hand Whoa. away. Two bucks, two stuff. Okay, we're going to go the other way. We're going to go the easy way. Yeah, 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 good thinking. Oh, it's really easy. As long as you don't want to go anywhere, it's fine. Buggy slightly left. Okay, sending the kite up high. And turn. Keep the kite high. Keep the kite high. Keep turning, keep turning. Fantastic. Send the kite up and down. Oh, hey. Down with the kite and up and up. Oh. Feet down. Yeah. <laughs> You've got I was it. doing it. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, man. And for the first time, I've ever powered myself by anything other than the combustion engine and Shanks' pony. That was pretty thrilling. I'm starting to feel a bit like Scott of the Antarctic now. I don't know, or a mixture of that and Lawrence of Arabia. I can't really see or hear anything except the wind and the sand. But it was a truly exhilarating experience. I can see the appeal of spending a morning being battered by the elements. It gives you a real glow. But as sea swimmers and paracarders will tell you, half of the enjoyment of being out in the cold is warming up afterwards. Sheltering from the elements is as much fun as being out in them. And in the town of Littlehampton on the Sussex coast is a place which has made that idea a major part of its appeal. Well, at a first glance, it looks like it's made of chocolate, but it's not melting. And then you think plastic, and then you realise, in fact, it's metal of some sort. What is it, you ask yourself? This remarkable structure is actually East Beach Cafe. How marvellous. Thank you very much. It's owned and run by Jane Wood. Cheers. Cheers. The building's extraordinary appearance is the vision of British designer Thomas Heatherwick. And what was the thinking behind the design specifically? Thomas said two things about it which really sold me the idea of him designing it. One was that this building belongs to the beach. And uh, what do we get from the beach? We get driftwood, we get stones, and we get little blocks of wood. And this building should resemble one of those things. And also, he felt that we needed prospect so that we got this great view, but we would also have refuge within the building. And that's why the building is so successful in the winter, because it is cosy. What a lovely combination it is, because you feel like you're in something solid, but you've still got all that light, airy view. There's a very basic pleasure to be had watching the weather rage from the comfort of a warm little building. It's a feeling I know all too well from winter days spent in my beach hut at Whitstable. It may not have way to service, but there are few places I'd rather be. Particularly on a day like today. Even in March, the unpredictable British weather can deliver some truly beautiful days. You got any nice fresh local mackerel? I have. Marvellous. I tell you what, could I have um, some cockles as well, please? We you still call it half a pint, I'm glad about that. Yeah. <laughs> This is why I love Whitstable. Look, the boat's just come in. Fresh mackerel, they're already knocking £1.49 off a kilo. 
It's been a pleasure to discover that so many people share my love of the seaside out of season. And although I'm still a traditionalist at heart, I've enjoyed seeing some modern elements creeping in. I'm doing my coat on. I'm at home now. But when all's said and done, for me, you can't beat the basic comforts of the good old-fashioned beach hut. And one of the great joys of beach hut life is that there's a real community here. Rupert, how are you, old Bean? Very, very well indeed. How's things? Where's the flag? You look like the Queen. The only reason I know you're here is when your Union Jack's up. <laughs> Can I have a little barbecue on the beach, Rupert? Uh, yeah, why not? Is it, is, it, is it warm enough? Of course it is. Six ninety nine, fully controllable, but it's a marvellous thing. It's a thing of great beauty. I've got a windbreak. This is one of the great miracles of modern science. It's a great thing. Look at that. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> it's 2012. Oh, the Olympics come to London. <laughs> we need now some wind. But I'm not sure there is any wind. This is what it's all about. And the moment the first fish hits the barbecue, my wife and friends somehow find their way down to the beach. Cheers. Rupert, are you a fan of the seaside out of season? I am, as a matter of fact. The Sundays are the best, because it's very, very quiet and still, and relaxing and calm. Better here. I love it when it's cold and you sit down and your little jumper on and you come down with a nice coffee and it whistled around. I love it out of season more than in season. In season, it's just there's too many people. But out of season, like on a day like today, look, there's no one around. Who will I think there's one other hut being used. It's perfect. It's like a little secret, isn't it? Mm. A little seaside secret we've got here that nobody else really knows about. Probably not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a very good point. I'd hate to think that my special stretch of beach might be as busy as a bank holiday weekend all year round. But when you discover a little-known pleasure like this, you can't help wanting to share it. This is the place to be. It has the perfect combination of, of all the things I like about the seaside. But of course, without getting too emotional after a glass or two of cheap white wine, all experiences about people, aren't they? So nice. And oysters. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rupert, because I couldn't find a full stop to that <laughs> sentence. I thought the seagull was going to do it for us there. <laughs> Joe, sing us another oyster. <laughs> Next on Blighty, the hobby that's turned into a job for some. Great work if you can get it. Meet the beer tickers next. <laughs> 